Here we are live on Friday. It is the Friday night lock-in live stream coming to you from San Diego, California. No turtleneck today, and I'm sure I'll get 500 questions about that, but the temperatures and the patriotism has demanded that I wear something different tonight. Uh, so we're going to have a great battle tonight, a battle of the Whiskey Nation. So welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining in. Thanks for tuning in and uh, giving us your time. We've got Maureen joining us and Peter. Good to see you all. Thanks for joining in. Uh, we're going to put Irish whiskey against American whiskey tonight. It is a battle for the ages. My foot is in both camps because I'm living in America, but isn't my heart made of Irish materials? So we're going to have a, a challenge on our hands tonight to... Uh, to see who's going to be the uh, who's going to come out of this with the uh, the ultimate prize is it Ireland or is it America? We've got um, Peter says nice stories and sips shirt. Yeah, I thought we'd be a little bit patriotic. We've got the new brand as well, stories and sips. I'm testing out the new shirt. Irish whiskey fan. Where's the turtleneck? See, I knew it already. Getting the questions. There's no turtleneck tonight. It will not be put on. It's 85 degrees here and the air conditioning costs a fortune and it's about, which is the equivalent of about 30 degrees in Ireland. So it's uh, the Irish whiskey fan t-shirt tonight, Stories and Sips t-shirt tonight to keep me alive without heat stroke while we do our battle of the uh, of the whiskey nations tonight. So let me know where you are, what you're drinking. Evening, Tommy Doyle, John Keane, Colleen, admiring the shirt as well. Happy Friday to Greg from Greater Dublin, Ohio. I never heard of a Greater Dublin in Ohio, but we'll we'll accept it, uh, as opposed to Lesser Dublin. Stacy's got a whiskey smash. <laughs> Low 90 degrees in Ohio. Yeah, it's hot all over the country, hence why there's no turtleneck tonight. Instead, there's a t-shirt to allow me to move my arms and gesticulate and wave them around and scream and shout to support Irish whiskey uh, as we have our battle of the whiskey nation tonight. So I'm already starting to sip on mine. I'm making no bones about it. I'm sipping away on my uh, Bushmills 21, which will be the second whiskey which will go head to head tonight. But I started my sipping already. Uh, let me know where you are and what you're drinking. It's going to be a, a good old one. John is uh, Johnny's drinking Red Breast. Good man, Johnny, in Long Beach, New York. John Dempster in County Down is joining us. Alan says, 30 degrees is farmer's tan weather. It is indeed. Most Irish people only have a tan on their arms, if, if at all. <laughs> Brendan says, no turtleneck. Well, Brendan, you saw yourself on the website. They're sold out. No turtlenecks tonight. Tonight is T-shirt night with the heat that we have. We'll pretend it's summer. Patrick, good man, Patrick, joining us. Patrick from Clonakilty, joining us in Florida. Muggy, Florida. No doubt. No doubt. <laughs> Michael, who's sitting in the backstage waiting to go on, waiting to join us to present, says, I've outdone myself with the backstage setup. Yeah, I've, I've been plying him with Red Breast Dreamcast in the back there to make sure that he chooses Ireland as the winner tonight. So Michael's got his, his hands full. So Brendan's drinking Killarney Cask in Passage West, overlooking Cove there, Brendan, uh, Brendan overlooking Carrigaloo. And Paddy Knight in Hamden, Connecticut. Good stuff. <laughs> Tommy said he only saw my neck once, and it was in person. So this is my first time my neck being seen on the uh, on the show. <laughs> right, so tonight is the Battle of the Nations, the Battle of the Whiskey Nations. It is American whiskey versus Irish whiskey. Uh, a throwdown. An absolute battle for the ages. Where only one winner can come out of this. There can only be one winner. And there's a man that's going to help moderate and judge that and going to lead us through the ceremony tonight. And I'm going to bring him in now to chat to us. And that is the Prince of Paddy, Mr. Michael Cowman. Welcome. Barry, how are you doing, my friend? How are things? Brilliant. I'm ready to I'm ready to throw down. Am I nervous? Sure, don't I have Irish whiskey on my side? Like I know, but you are representing the entire Irish nation. Um, so it's very important that you, you know, you come out swinging and you represent it well. I mean, I've dressed up here for the occasion. I have my, I have my paddy cap for Ireland, and I'm going to have my baseball out here for the for the states. So, you know, representing both sides. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> we, we we don't pay Michael very much for these things. Like you know, only ply him with Dreamcast. Yet still, he comes up with costumes and commits to the role fully. Like. <laughs> 
it's important to, to lean into these things. You know, that's that's why I keep getting the call back, you know. Um, but should be should be an interesting night. I'm looking forward to seeing your defense and to seeing the the, Amer- the American put in as well. Where are you joining us from tonight? The sunny southeast night. Uh, so I'm down in, in the home place in Wexford. So it's finally legal to, to leave Dublin. So I've, I've taken the little spin down here to Bunk in the sunny southeast. Uh, it wasn't overly sunny. It lashed rain all day, but such is an Irish summer. You know yourself. It happens on a Tuesday in Ireland. That's that's the summer. Yeah. Joe says tonight's going to be a, a slobber knocker, whatever that means. It must be a Dublin phrase. But I think that's a, that's a WWF, WWE uh, phrase, oh. if, if, I'm, if I'm correct. But yeah, that's why I brought the, the bat. It is a social distancing tool and it's to break you two up if, you, if things get heated. Belfast Whiskey Week, Paul O'Kane joining us saying, it's great to have a judge with integrity. He, well, he's clearly not met you, but uh, we're lucky to have you anyway. That is an absolute, like, that statement in itself, yeah, he clearly has no idea. So what is going to happen tonight? Tonight is we're going to have a, a battle. We're going to bring in our, our my uh, not our opponent, because you're not on my side, of course, tonight. Not on your side, uh, Barry. You're, you're, you're right in the middle. We're going to bring on my opponent in a, in a minute or two, Leanne Sims from the American side of things. So um, give us a broad overview, Michael, of what we're going to do tonight. Yes, we're going to have a nice, clean fight, Barry. Uh, we're going to have Ireland versus the US. So Leanne's going to come in. She's going to introduce herself. She's going to introduce her category. Um, then we're going to swing back across to you. You're going to introduce yourself. You're going to introduce the category of Irish whiskey. We're going to swing back across to, across the water to the United States, and Leanne is going to take us through her first whiskey. And again, switch back to you. You take us through your first whiskey, and at that point, I'm sure we'll have some questions, and I can throw some questions in as we go along if people have questions, uh, different things. And we're, I believe we're going to have a toast from each one of you, and a little speech has been prepared and everything. So we're taking this very seriously. You know, this is people standing up, people putting their best foot forward, representing their nation. And I don't think we can overstate how serious this is. And I'd like to thank you for selecting me because, you know, uniquely, I suppose I have a foot in both camps, uh, we, we, we might say, uh, that, that allows me to be impartial here. You do have a foot in both camps, but I'm not going to try and sway you in any way with any graphics on the screen at any point. I'm not going to try and push you in any direction at all. Um, but just know that uh, I'm hoping for an Irish win tonight. Listen, Barry, I'm just hoping for a good, clean fight and uh, some great whiskey. That's all I want. There'll definitely be some great whiskey, no doubt about it. Um, so let me have a look at the comments. It sounds like people are excited for it. Uh, people are, are raring to go. Um let me see. All right. We've already got some smack talk from Brian Redden being in Ohio. And the only good thing to come out of Kentucky are empty bourbon barrels to be shipped and filled with beautiful Irish whiskey. Well, listen, we can't have smack talk like that without bringing in our representative from the Southern States. Uh, and, and without further ado, ado, I should bring in Leanne to join us. Leanne, such horrible smack talk already happening uh, to the beloved Kentucky. But you're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for inviting me onto your platform to talk about one of my favorite subjects, American whiskey. It's a rarity to allow any invader to this Irish, the most Irish of platforms. And I notice that you've you've come not just with whiskey, but it looks like you've come with some stars and some stripes as well. Uh, well, yes, I have. <laughs> I have worn my finest. <laughs> You're wearing the flag. Dress. Can I just say that already, already, I think Leanne is ahead in terms of marks, in terms of effort she actually put in getting dressed, Barry. I mean, come on. Hold on a second now. The one day I don't have a turtleneck on and I lose points to someone who dresses in a flag. Yeah. Come on. You should have had a green, white and gold turtleneck. That, that would have got your points. I, I have some things here, but it's not the turtleneck like, but at least it says... Irish whiskey fan, you know, maybe that's that might not be enough, but we'll see. We'll see. Michael's squinting to find it. Yeah. Right. Or, as Andrew says here, score one for the Yank. All right. So Leanne's ahead already. This is no good. Stacy says her, her outfit's pretty snazzy. And Chris thinks we're in the, the squared circle for tonight for the uh, for a WWE throwdown. Well, we kind of are, I suppose. <laughs> 
Joe says the fact that nobody's wearing an Irish jersey. I don't even have an Irish jersey here in California. Like, I shouldn't have said that. I, I'm going to be slated by the Irish. Oh, God. All right. So we have excitement. Adam Keane says we should have had a Cork jersey on. I know. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a different country, Barry, so you couldn't have a Cork jersey on. That's true. This isn't the people's, although the, one of the whiskeys tonight might come from the People's Republic of Cork. We'll that's see how fair. we go. That's a fair point. All right. So we have a we have a good agenda, a lineup for tonight of how we're going to go through this. And my understanding is that we're going to start with Leanne, who's going to introduce herself and, and share, Leanne, why you are uniquely qualified to represent the great states of the United States and tell us a little bit about American whiskey. So I suppose, Michael, as compare and MC, do you want to... Yeah, I can charge? do that. Listen, I want to lay out the rules. Um, we're going to keep it really simple. I just want you to put your best foot forward. Um, if you, you want to touch gloves, just, you know, can you touch? No? <laughs> okay, don't. Then. That's fine, too. Um, okay, so yeah, we're going to swing to Leanne first over in the United States. Uh, well, I guess you're both in the United States, representing the United States. And she's going to give us a quick introduction to herself and a quick introduction to the category she's representing before we swing back to the Emerald Isle and Barry is going to do likewise. Okay, so Leanne. All right, you. thank you guys. My name is Leanne Sims and uh, I am going to be representing American Whiskey tonight. Um, a little bit about me, um, I grew up in the Louisville, Kentucky area, so that's really all I need to be qualified to talk about American whiskey. I do also happen to be a certified uh, bourbon steward through the uh, Moonshine University Staven Thief Society, hence the pin here. Um, so, and my first whiskey tonight is going to be Uncle Nearest. So if you guys would all raise a glass with me to toast the rich history of American history, of American whiskey. Cheers. 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 Leanne, tell us about the category of American whiskey. What is American whiskey? Well, American whiskey has several categories. Um, it includes rye whiskey, um, Tennessee whiskey, bourbon, of course, and then different grain whiskeys like wheat, corn. Um, so there are several different categories in American whiskey. Perfect. Okay. Um, well, I want you to remember anyone who's watching in, send in your questions as well because the guys need to be, pre you know, we need to get them, put them under pressure and uh, ask your questions about, about bourbon, about American whiskey, and about Irish whiskey. Barry, if you're ready, we'll swing across to you. Great. So my name is Barry Chandler, and I am from Cork in Ireland, a proud Corkonian, and I'm living in the United States, and I'm here tonight to represent not just Irish whiskey, but the entire island of Ireland and the pride of a nation in sharing some of our greatest exports, apart from myself, in the form of the brown water that we send all over the world. And... Um, I have no qualifications to be speaking about Irish whiskey, unlike Leanne. The only qualification I might have is that I grew up 12 miles away from the Middleton Distillery in County Cork. So by pure proximity and maybe some of the osmosis of that uh, angel's share in the air coming out of my door in Cove in the morning, I might have been able to inhale an old drop of Jameson. Uh, that is my only qualification. But I'm going to make up for that lack of credentials and lack of qualifications by spouting the blarney that we're known for and talking my way to a win tonight so that's that's where i'm coming from good stuff right listen that's a strong start um so what we're going to do now is we're going to swing back across over to leanne and she's going to take us through her first whiskey okay so as i said um starting with uncle nearest uh so this is a tennessee whiskey um, Uncle Nearest, uh, the best whiskey maker the world never knew. 
Um, Nathan Green, known to his family and friends as Uncle Nearest, was the first African-American master distiller of record. Um, his story was all but lost until a woman by the name of Fawn Weaver um, did some digging around Lynchburg, Tennessee, and uh, found a story of friendship and respect. Um, she interviewed several residents there and some of his family members and uh, found out that Uncle Nearest was not only an amazing distiller, but that he taught the famous Jack Daniels how to distill uh, whiskey. He also uh, had a hand in uh, developing and perfecting the Lincoln County process, which is the process by which Tennessee whiskey has to be made. It has to be filtered through uh, maple charcoal. Um, there is a short film about Uncle Nearest. I highly recommend that you Google it and watch it. If it doesn't bring a tear to, an eye, to your eye, there's something very wrong with you. Um, but the other part of the story that I thought was really fun was uh, a Fawn, when Fawn Weaver went to Lynchburg, Tennessee with her husband um, and was talking to a lot of people, she realized or found out that the property where Nathan Green, Uncle Nearest, distilled was for sale. Um, so she went to the property and there's this white house on a property and there's a spring, which is perfect for distilling. And the distillery is long, long gone. But um, so she called a realtor to because uh, she wanted to buy the property. And the realtor was a woman by the name of Sherry Moore. And as they were talking and, and trading stories, uh, it turned out that Sherry Moore was a uh, in charge of operations at Jack Daniels for 30 years and had just given up her job to become a realtor. Um, so they talked more and uh, stars aligned. And now uh, then Fawn Weaver uh, started Uncle Nearest Whiskey Brand and Sherry Moore is the, uh, she runs operations and she also is the uh, master blender. Um, I met Sherry in New Orleans uh, a couple of years ago at the Bourbon Festival. Uh, I purchased tickets to have dinner with Fawn Weaver because I, I have a girl crush on her after everything that I've, I've read. When I showed up to the dinner at the Pel Pelican Club, uh, I learned that Fawn Weaver was not going to be able to be there because she was stuck in New York City. Um, and I was disappointed until I started talking with Sherry Moore, who's just an amazing person. Um, we got to be friends and on our way back home, she uh, took us to the site of the, the property where uh, Nathan, Uncle Nearest, uh, distilled his spirits and also the house where Jack Daniel and he lived. Um, we actually got to stand in Jack Daniel's boyhood bedroom, which was pretty cool for us. So um, the whiskey itself is, is highly awarded. Um, it has a beautiful amber color. Uh, Great on the nose, a lot of caramel and vanilla, um, and just a smooth, sweet Tennessee whiskey. Do you know what that was, Barry? That was Leanne knocking the first one out of the park, I think, you know? So I think that story from Uncle Nearest is definitely one that brings a tear to the eye. Leanne, there was a question in there from Alan in Cork. He was just wondering, do you know the name of the movie off the top of your head by any chance? Um, the, it's, it's called the greatest, the greatest whiskey maker the world never knew. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. I think based on, you know, that first one, obviously Barry, we're going to kick it over to you now in a second, but a very strong start and the times we're living in, I think we all need a story that brings things together. So Barry, over to you. What have you got for me? But the first thing I've got for you is I've got to change this flag on the screen. If we're to truly get move into the Irish category, I have to strip the stars and stripes from behind us and no. put up here the, the tricolor. And uh, yes, it's over to me. So I suppose I should start with a toast. Uh, like all good Irish uh, nights out, they start with a good toast. I'm going to be drinking Red Breast 12 cask strength is going to be my first whiskey. But before we talk about it, before we introduce it, I'd like to, you all to raise your glasses, raise them up in the air, put our glasses forward, and let me lead you all in a toast uh, for Irish whiskey. So there are good ships and there are wood ships. There are ships that sail the sea, but the best ships are friendships, and may they always be. 
And may the roof above us never fall in and the friends beneath it never fall out. And as they say in India, get it India. Slaunch it. All right, so that's my toast. And I'm leading the charge from Ireland. And I've got to up my game. I'm hearing in the comments that Leanne is crushing me already with her stars and stripes dress and her patriotism and her storytelling. I'm going to have to up the game seriously. So what better way to up the game than to introduce this incredible whiskey, Redbreast, 12-year-old, cask strength. It has spent a minimum of 12 years sleeping silently in Oloroso sherry and ex-bourbon barrels in the beautiful county of Cork in Middleton, in East Cork, 12 miles from the city of Cork. 12 years at a minimum sleeping through wet winters and wet summers before it eventually finds its way into a bottle. There's no water even added to the whiskey when it comes out of the barrel. Rather, it's, battled, it's uh, bottled at cask strength, so none of that flavor is lost. What we have here is an incredible whiskey from a storied brand, Redbreast, one of the most, the most awarded single pot still whiskey, uh, whiskeys in the world. It's a, it's a slightly less potent sibling. Redbreast 12 uh, has been awarded more awards than any other pot still whiskey. And this is a legendary brand. This is not a brand that was invented by a marketing team sitting in a fancy office. Rather, this brand stretches back more than 100 years. The first mention of Redbreast is in 1912 in Dublin, the first advertisement for Redbreast. Originally, what was known as a bonder brand. So this was a, a whiskey that was released by a whiskey bonder, a whiskey bonder by the name of Gilby's and so on, or Gil, uh, Gilby's wine merchants in Dublin. And Gilby's imported sherry and port and Madeira and wines from, the, from mainland Europe to their uh, offices in Dublin in the late 1800s. And when they had emptied those barrels and filled up bottles and sold them to hotels and bars and restaurants, they were left with empty barrels. And somebody had the good idea to take those empty barrels a mile across the city to the old Jameson distillery in Bow Street in Dublin and have them filled up with pot still whiskey. Bring those barrels back to the cellars underneath the city of Dublin and age gracefully for a number of years. When Gilby's released Redbreast, it was an instant hit. It was a, it was a, it was a much sought after, known as the priest's tipple. The priests uh, were big fans of Redbreast because Gilby's also had the contract to supply altar wine to the churches around Ireland. So as they would have gone around to the parochial homes uh, uh, trying to sell their their altar wine, the priest might have looked over the shoulder of the salesperson and said, "Have you anything a bit stronger in the bag?" And they would have said, "We do. We have a drop of Redbreast." And then the priest started ordering red breast in the bars. And when people saw the priest ordering it, they knew it must be good because they were the only ones with money at the time. So red breast is a single pot still whiskey, still made to this day to a formula not too dissimilar to how it was made 100 years ago. Today, it's made in the Middleton distillery. And it's a single pot still whiskey, which means it's made from a mixture of malted barley and unmalted barley. And what makes red breast so unique is its use of fortified wine casks ex Oloroso sherry uh, casks that are used in its maturation. Uh, as much as 25% of the component whiskies in here have been aged in Oloroso sherry. Potsil whiskey aged in ex bourbon, ex Oloroso sherry married together, given to us here in this beautiful, beautiful bottle, red breast cask strength, which is consistently uh, recognized as one of the greatest Irish whiskies that is out there and a very affordable whiskey too. So I have it here in my glass. Make sure I've got the right one. Yep, that's the Bushmills over there. So I've got the Red Breast 12 cast strength here. Beautiful marmalade color. And then on the nose, mm, unmistakable stewed fruits like fruit cobbler, a little bit of sherry on the notes, oakiness, apricots, absolute fruit, stewed fruit bomb on the nose, a little bit of mint. And then on the palate, powerful, powerful on the palate, big, thick, typical pot still spice, creaminess, high ABV. This one's bottled at 55.8%, three or four more sips, and I'll be giving this talk on my side, lying on the floor, high ABV, but the palate, beautiful balance of spiciness, of creaminess. It is overflowing with character, with, 
what we would call the Christmas cake, spices and flavors, raisins, currants, but an absolute gem of a whiskey, something that should be on every Irish whiskey fan's shelf. And if it's not, it should be. Um, today, the Redbreast brand is stewarded and taken care of by a man called Billy Lighton, the master blender uh, at, the, at the Middleton Distillery. And just like Leanne was lucky enough to meet uh, the woman responsible for Uncle Nearest, I was lucky enough a few years ago to meet Billy Lighton for the first time. And I was in a bar in Dublin in the Westbury Hotel, and I saw him sitting across the bar with his wife, having a drink with a few others from the Middleton Distillery. And... Uh, I was determined to have my fanboy moment and I waited for my moment. And when Billy's wife got up to go to the bathroom, I leapt over the tables like a gazelle and sat down in the seat beside Billy who didn't know who I was from Adam and thought I was going to rob him at gunpoint, I'd say. And he said, hello, how are you? And I said, I'm fine, how are you? I just wanna shake your hand and thank you for making the lovely red breast. And before we knew it, wasn't he buying red breast and we were sitting there sipping on red breast together. And I've been a fan of this beautiful juice ever since. And it is my favorite whiskey to have on my shelf. So this is representing Ireland. It's representing Middleton. It's representing pot still whiskey. And I have to say, it's one of the greatest Irish whiskies out there. And I think American whiskey is going to have a tough time to beat it. Wow. That Barry, was so good, sir. Well, Barry, oh, listen, all I can do is I can tip my cap to you. Uh, my, my paddy cap here, I tip it to you. That was, a, that was an excellent uh, rendition. That was an excellent speech. I think you represented Ireland very well. From my point of view, I, I, I wish I had some toasts that I could say on uh, a show like this, all mine are not fit for, for public consumption. Uh, unlike Redbreast, which is obviously a very story brand, and I think you represented it very well. Uh, Time-wise, Barry, I, you know, I think you got the, the full use out of the time there, and I, I think you really conveyed the, the, the tasting notes across as well so so that's round one and what i'm going to ask is for everybody in comments to let us know what are your thoughts who took round one are we going to america or are we staying over with barry in ireland he's filibustering he absolutely was um, i think we would have been there for the night had we let him but i uh, yeah we we did I, I did send him a text on the slide just to, to wrap it up a little bit there barry you know? <laughs> Okay. It's hard not to be passionate about red breasts. Like you just have to keep talking and drinking and screaming about it. I think I think the guys from Hinch were talking about. You know, it's an automatic uh, ten points because it's from Cork. Not with this judge. Uh, you know, I, uh, that chip on my shoulder just never goes away, Barry. But yeah, again, guys, let us know in the comments. I can see Barry Ireland Irish. It was a draw. Oh, you know what I mean. So yeah, Ireland. It's looking like a resounding victory in round one for Ireland, but all hope is not lost. So what we're going to do is we're going to switch back to Leanne. Leanne, as well, on this one, if you have a toast, no pressure if you don't, but if you have a toast you'd like to share with us, uh, feel free as well. So what we're going to do, we're going to throw it back to you in Ohio, and you can tell us all about American whiskey number two. All right. So first I'm going to do my, uh, my little speech on, on American whiskey. Um, so American whiskey reflects the diversity of its people. Um, the melting pot of cultures that makes American great also makes our whiskey great. American whiskey has survived rebellion, war, prohibition, and the vodka, the vodka craze of the 1980s. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize the contributions of the Irish to American whiskey. Irish settlers brought their whiskey and their stills to America. They brought it here and it was perfected here. It was perfected here because of our natural resources, our indigenous people, and early immigrants from around the world. American white oak trees were abundant and perfect for making barrels. Their dramatic changes, season changes, pushed the whiskey in and out of the barrel staves, imparting beautiful amber color and flavor. Native Americans gave us corn, the main ingredient in many American whiskeys. West African slaves taught us charcoal filtering that we now call the Lincoln County process. Pioneering women such as Catherine Carpenter invented the sour mash process that is still used today. No, it wasn't James C. Crow, as you might have read. There are different categories of American whiskey. There's corn, wheat, 
rye, Tennessee whiskey, bourbon, and they all must comply with U.S. Code of Federal Regulations. They cannot be distilled at more than 160 proof. There can be no additives. All must be aged in new charred oak containers, except for corn whiskey, which is moonshine. Tennessee whiskey has a special designation in the North American Free Trade Agreement, also known as NAFTA. And in 1964, the U.S. Congress recognized bourbon as America's native spirit. American whiskey brought about the first Consumer Protection Act to the American people, known as the Bottled and Bond Act of 1897, which was introduced by Colonel E.H. Taylor to protect consumers against counterfeit whiskey that made people sick or worse. American whiskey saved lives and brought comfort to soldiers on the battlefield. Nurses, mostly women, on the front lines of the battlefield treated the sick and wounded with whiskey-soaked cloths to sterilize and dress wounds and they use it to anesthetize patients. American whiskeys are among the best-selling whiskeys in the world with some sources placing Jack Daniels as the number one whiskey in the world. In 2019, American whiskey sales topped $4 billion. In closing, there is no doubt that Irish whiskey and American whiskey are both delicious brown spirits, but I believe that American whiskey is superior because of the variety of flavors due to the different grains used. And I prefer a sweeter whiskey that is American whiskey. Cheers. Like Babe Ruth, like Babe Ruth, right? Just knocking it out of the park there again, you know? Uh, so you're gonna have a big act to follow. I think some great points there from Leanne. Important to note that the vodka craze and for whiskey to survive the vodka craze, which I think if it hadn't, we would have been all the poorer. Um, obviously, you know, some great stories of inclusion, some great stories of taking different traditions from different parts of the world, including Ireland, Wales, wherever, uh, different different parts of, of, of the globe and incorporating into the American whiskey story, I think is really important. Barry, I mean, we're going to swing over to you. Um, I, think, I think I know my winner for round one. I'm looking at the comments. But uh, yeah, Barry, we're gonna go over to you. And listen, I'm not saying there's a lot of pressure on you, but the entire, I suppose the hopes and dreams of the Irish nation are are sitting on your shoulders right now. So let's see what you got. So this Bring is it. my stump speech. This is my rabble rousing speech. As if this is the one I have to use to this, win over the crowd. This is the one where you you are walking out. You're you're bare chested. You're you're standing out in front of the in front of the, you know, you're about to go to war. This is brave hard stuff now, Barry. This is where you have to hold the people together, you know? You have the sword in hand, or whiskey, you know, which, you know, whichever. And we want you to, to bring the nation together. And not only the nation, you need to convince all the Americans watching in here, you need to convince them that Irish whiskey is the thing. You know, this is this is your job. And- Okay. <laughs> It's never been so serious. It's never been so serious. I've never felt so much pressure. My back is sore from trying to carry the nation. And I know that I'll do it well. And I know we have a second whiskey we're gonna come back to, but first, first, I do need to echo the sentiments of a nation as we wave the flag in the battle of the two great whiskey nations. And I feel like I'm up to the challenge. So I'm gonna put myself on full screen here because I Take need all of your attention. Here we go. Yours, Barry. Take it. <laughs> All right, folks. I guess it's over to me to make the case for Irish whiskey. So I will make the case for Irish whiskey, and I'll do that with red breast in my hand. So let's start now, folks, by establishing a fact. The Irish invented whiskey. In the 1300s, the first recorded mention of Irish whiskey can be found in the Red Book of Ossery, mentioned by none other than a bishop. And we know that bishops don't lie. Not only did we invent whiskey, we've spent the last 700 years perfecting it. Not like Leanne has said that the Americans have spent the last few hundred years per uh, perfecting it. No, it is the Irish. There have been many imitations of Irish whiskey, like scotch, bourbon, American whiskies, but nothing I think you'll agree comes close to the original drop of Irish. Of course, the very word whiskey comes from the Irish language. 
And whether you take the E out or you leave the E in, there's nobody is going to argue with you that uh, any historical study of the etymology of the word whiskey will lead you anywhere else other than Ireland. Now, the Scottish may claim to have invented single malts, but weren't we making it in Ireland 30 miles across the North Sea in bushmills since the 1600s? And if the Scottish are determined to stick to their guns and say that they invented it, we should remind them that they're just shipwrecked Irish. When the British Crown saw just how much whiskey we were making in Ireland, they thought to themselves, we'll have a bit of that. And didn't they slap a tax on malted barley in the 1700s? Only the Irish weren't going to let them get away with that. And they weren't going to let the British dissuade them. And didn't they respond with a, oh, no, you won't instead deciding to make whiskey with unmalted barley as well as barley as well as barley reducing the tax take due to the crown and in doing so improving on a whiskey that most people in the world knew couldn't even be improved upon and they did making pot still whiskey and on to america ireland's worthy opponent tonight in our battle of the nations that great bastion of hope and freedom that welcomed so many Irish, so many tired and hungry and the huddled masses to seek a new life as Leanne so uh, eloquently alluded to. Only the of the millions of Irish that found their way through Ellis Island in New York and across the Atlantic, there were many in that number uh, that were well used to distilling and making elixirs that, if not taken in moderation, could have made you blind in just a little sip. These men and women, they found their way across America to the hills of Appalachia. And when they saw America's fields of corn and rye, didn't they look to one another and say, are you thinking what I'm thinking? And of course they were. And they planted and they sowed those fields and they harvested those fields and they took those grains and they turned them into something beautiful, a whiskey. And the crack was had because just like the crack has been had whenever a bottle of whiskey is popped open, music ensues, laughter ensues. Nobody has ever looked at a bottle of Irish whiskey that's brought out in a party and said, oh, no, not a drop of that stuff. No, no. And more than the liquid in a bottle alone, Irish whiskey sparks conversation. It builds friendships and it inspires stories like we're sharing tonight. And ultimately, it gives us sips like Redbreast that we deserve. Look, it is a gift to us. It has made, it is made entirely from nature. It is a natural thing. It is a gift to us. It is good for us. It is good to us. A man once said that whiskey, uh, that whiskey was invented to prevent the Irish from taking over the world. Well, I say nice try, not even close, because that has not prevented us, but rather encouraged us. And we're only getting started. The Irish playwright John B. Keane said it best when he was interviewed sitting in his kitchen. He said, and I quote, I love the plop of whiskey into a glass. I love it. I love to listen to it. I love to see the cream on a pint. I love the first violent, powerful impact of a glass of whiskey when I throw it back in me and it hits the bottom below. John B. Keane knew what he was talking about. And to steal and bastardize a phrase from an iconic American himself a descendant of a proud Cork man, Henry Ford, you can have whiskey from any country you want as long as it's Irish. So let's get our sips on. Let's raise a glass to each other and to the next glass and to the next glass. Irish whiskey may have been around for the past 700 years, but if the number of new distilleries, number of new whiskies, and number of new risk takers that are turning their hand to it are any indication, we're only getting started. Watch out, America. We're about to take over the world of whiskey again. Slauncha. I'm sorry, Barry, just give me a minute. <laughs> I'm a little bit emotional right now. Um, okay, sorry. I'm back. Yeah, no, Barry, uh, I mean, your your powers of oratory are... are you know, they're, they're unparalleled, really. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about the whiskey. Um, I think that was, a, that was a very strong, very rousing speech. And again, we can see in the comments that people are, are very responsive to it. Um, God bless Barry. Is Michael crying? Yes, Michael. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Yeah, Michael had a moment there. Uh, you know, proud Irishman, 
it's, it's in here, it's in my heart as well. I'm trying to stay impartial. Uh, it's very important. And just as a note on my impartiality, obviously Bar Barry has me on here judging tonight. Well, you know, my heart is in Ireland. Uh, my wages are paid in America. So, you know, the, this is why I, I managed to stay impartial tonight because you never you never bite the hand that feeds you. So that's just, it's all keep that in mind when, when I'm judging tonight. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to switch back. We're going to go over to Leanne. She's going to talk to us about her second whiskey tonight. And we're going to go back to the, the United States of America. And can I just take this moment to say, as it is almost 20 to 1 here in Ireland on the 4th of July, can I say happy Independence Day to all my American friends. And Thank I'll raise you. both of you before you kick off your second whiskey. So over to you, Leanne. Let's go in. All right. So for my second whiskey, I have chosen Old Pogue. Um, Old Pogue is... Maysville, Kentucky. Um, it was first made in 1876. It was established by Henry Edgar Pogue the first. Um, it was actually distillery number three in the United States. So, um, and it immediately took off and established and was established throughout the states um, as a superior whiskey of quality. Um, correspondence dating back to the 1900s have uh, been uncovered that show accolades all over the world and uh, and orders from all over the world for Old Pogue whiskey. Um, Edgar Pogue the first passed away, um, and then the distiller was taken over by Edgar Pogue the second. Um, both of those men died in tragic distillery accidents. Um, and then Edgar Pogue the third was at war, learned of his father's death and came over, came home to, uh, run the distillery. Uh, but in 1919, uh, prohibition hit, they tried to make, uh, whiskey for medicinal purposes for a while, but that just didn't work out. And so they ended up selling the distillery and then it closed, um, in 1926. And then in the early 2000s, uh, the fifth and sixth generation Pogues decided they wanted to resurrect their family's whiskey. So John Pogue um, was a geologist for the oil industry and decided to dig up his great grandfather, great great grandfather's recipes and resurrect um, the, the brand. And so we did. Um, it is a beautiful distillery. And as I said, in Maysville, it's right on the Ohio River. Uh, Maysville is where George Clooney is from. Um, but that's for another, uh, I guess, tequila debate. Um, but it is a smooth, spicy, sweet, wonderful whiskey. Um, they make other products, but this is by far my favorite. Um, you get a lot of toffee. Um, a lot of orange blossom and oak. That's what they tell you you're supposed to taste. Um, I don't like to go by what the tasting notes say. I like to go by what I taste and what I like. And what I taste and smell is a lot of caramel and vanilla. And if it doesn't smell or taste like a candy store, I probably won't like it very much. So um, this is perfect. And then if you guys would raise your glass uh, to Pogue with me for my final toast. May we never forget our rich history, the influences of men and women of all colors and creed, the ingenuity and perseverance of our ancestors lives in every bottle of American whiskey. Cheers. 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 Another strong round from Leanne and another arousing speech there. Um, definitely points for the name drop for George Clooney. Uh, you kind of got my vote right there anyway. But, I mean, this isn't all up to me. It's all up to the, the people who are watching in. Um, always always been a big George Clooney fan ever since his uh, days in Eeyore. But it's not about George Clooney. It's about the whiskey. And, again, people, you need to show your support in the comments. You need to tell us where do your loyalties lie, who's taking this round home, who's doing this. Um, because, you know, it's not about me. It's not about us. It's about these whiskeys. Right or wrong, Barry? Is it over? Is it over to me? <laughs> I suppose I, you know what I mean. If you if you leave me alone too long, I'll I'll get worse than you, and I'll run into a little diatribe myself and a little monologue. But go listen, for it. we'll swing it over to you. We'll swing it over to you. 
Uh, I have the Kleenex. I have the Kleenex here at the ready. Um, so let's see what you've got. Fun, All right. Uh, I, okay. Test. I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. All right. Let me go up here. All right. So the second whiskey to represent Ireland, I, I knew it had to be a big one. Redbreast is a stellar whiskey, but I wanted to share a couple of whiskeys that represented the island of Ireland and represented the historical past of Ireland that has laid the foundation for the future of Irish whiskey. And only two distilleries hold that mantle of being around for hundreds of years uh, that have weathered the storms, that have weathered the ups and downs of Irish whiskey. The Middleton Distillery in County Cork that gives us the wonderful red breast is one of them. And Bushmills in Northern Ireland is the other. So my second whiskey is going to be a beautiful drop of Bushmills 21. When I was growing up in Ireland in the 1980s, there were only two distilleries on the island of Ireland, Middleton and Bushmills. So I grew up in a country of just two distilleries, the, both of the distilleries I'm representing here tonight. If we didn't have Middleton, if we didn't have Bushmills, there'd be no whiskey industry, there'd be no Irish whiskey. Instead, we'd all be drinking scotch and speaking Scottish, and nobody wants to do that. These distilleries have been quietly, gently, fastidiously laying down whiskey for hundreds of years. If Middleton is known for single pot still whiskey and has flown the flag continuously for single pot still whiskey since 1825, there's a distillery that has flown the flag for another style of whiskey, and that is for single malt, because there's only one whiskey style that's made in Bushmills in Northern Ireland, and that is single malt whiskey, triple distilled single malt whiskey. Bushmills claims to be the oldest distillery in the world, and I'm not here to argue with them because I want Bushmills in my corner tonight. First granted a charter to distill whiskey in 1608. They proudly put those dates, put that date on the bottom of every single bottle. They released this whiskey a few years ago, the oldest age statement whiskey to be released and made available in the continuous lineup of whiskeys from Bushmills in Northern Ireland. Bushmills has survived the ups and downs of prohibition of civil war happening in the in the Republic of Ireland, of fires, of their records being destroyed. Theirs is a story of the phoenix rising from the ashes as well, and a story of survival. And I'm sure you'll agree with me that after 500, almost 500 years of distilling, they must have learned a thing or two about making whiskey. And I'll make the argument that Red or that Bushmills 21 proves that. So I'm going to pour a drop of this into my glass, and it's not going to be a small drop. It's going to be a drop that we should always drink the size of. A good, decent drop of Bushmills 21. What is Bushmills 21? It's a triple distilled single malt whiskey that has spent 19 years in a mixture of ex-bourbon and ex-oloroso sherry barrels that are then married together and spend two final years sleeping quietly while people sing to them and talk gently to the barrels as they age. And for the final two years, they sit there in beautiful Madeira with a sweetness coming out of those fortified wine barrels. And this is a stunning whiskey. It's my favorite single malt that comes out of Ireland by a long stretch. And I picked this up for cheaper than I've ever picked it up today, which means I'm happy to pour an extra big dose for myself but this is an unbelievable whiskey on the nose. It is figs and apricots, tropical mangoes, red berries, oh, and it's caramel all day long on the nose, absolutely beautiful. And then on the palate, you don't have that immediate spice or the heat of red breast because this is bottled at 40%. And it's a single malt, you don't have that pot still spice, but instead there's a creaminess somehow in this. And there's a velvetiness that coats the tongue. And it sits there in the tongue with baked apples and apricots coming through. And somebody has just heated up some sugar and some water and they're making a sugar syrup and they're coating their tongue with it. It is absolutely stunning. Another sip for me. This to me is the single malt to beat all single malts that come out of Ireland. And the reason I chose it is because it represents that other great style, malt whiskey, single malt whiskey. We're going to see more and more people uh, understanding that Irish whiskey isn't just a blend. It's not just pot stills, but there are tremendous things that have been coming out of Bushmills in Northern Ireland for the past 500 years. And so I want to raise a glass to that. On the top, on the shoulders of Bushmills 
and Redbreast and the Middleton Distillery stand every new distillery and Irish whiskey brand that has come out over the past 5, 10, 15, 20 years. And for that, we're very thankful. And I say, slant to Bushmills, slant to Bushmills 21. And here's to Irish whiskey. May we drink more and more of it and build that industry up again. Slant Oh, Barry, 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 Barry. I tell you, you're representing the North and South. You're doing a great job. I think there's a comment there that, that sums it up for me. Never enter enter a BS contest with an Irishman. <laughs> I think there's a lot to be said for it. I'm, I'm glad you didn't go into politics, Barry, because I'm not sure how pure your motives would be. I think you'd definitely get elected in the constituency of, of Cork East, you know? Um, I think you... You, you, missed your, you missed your calling, um, and the, the Healy Rays are always looking for an orator if, if you're looking for one. Anyway. <laughs> Cork um, South Central. Cork South Central, yeah. Uh, the seat of power in Ireland these days. Anyway, let's not get into the politics. What I want you guys to do in the comments is I want you to tell us what do you think? Who won the, who won the competition? Where do we send the trophy? Is it coming over to Ireland? Is it coming across the water? Or is it staying there in the, the US of A? And remember, you know, it is it is Independence Day as well, you know, so it would be nice. Yeah. I, I have some questions while we're getting comments. I'm curious, uh, Leanne, uh, about American whiskeys. Um, while they're obviously the inferior whiskey to Irish, um, I wonder what do you prefer about American whiskeys and what, what do you think sets them apart from, from Irish whiskey in your, in your opinion? Well, as I said, I, I like a sweeter whiskey. Um, and, and the corn and, and the wheat in American whiskey makes it sweeter. Um, I also think the different grains that are used um, give it more complexity. Um, so, and, and I chose these two particular whiskeys um, mainly for the story. Um, it was really hard for me to ever name my favorite whiskey. Um, so I chose two that are amazing. Um, but that also have a great story attached to them um, and a personal story with me. So, um, so that's why I chose these two whiskeys. I'm always um, struggling to understand the origin of bourbon in terms of bourbon and American whiskeys because of the complexity of who distills what and who sources what. It's something I've not yet been able to wrap my head around mm -hmm. as easy as I have in Ireland because there's fewer distilleries and brands right now. Help us understand these two whiskeys and, and where they come from distillery wise. Yeah. If you can. So, yeah. So Old Pogue, um, they actually make their own juice. Um, it's made in Maysville, Kentucky at their distillery, the same site uh, as back in 19 or 1876. Uh, um, so they make their own whiskey. Um, Uncle Nearest, they just built their distillery. So they actually uh, procure barrels different barrels and they blend them together to create the flavor profile that they want. Um, a lot of distilleries do that. They purchase barrels um, so that they have something to st sell while they are um, building out their distilleries or aging their whiskeys. So um, okay. the blend. So that is Sherry Moore's job. The gal that I met, um, her job is to taste different barrels and decide which barrels to use to blend together to make the whiskey that she wants. Okay. So you have a personal connection to each of those, which is which is nice as well. Yeah, um, John Pogue, actually, we have a bourbon club and uh, he came up and uh, met with us and hung out with us and told us the history and uh, just a really great guy, um, loves, loves American whiskey and um, it's just so cool. There, there are so many um, distilleries popping up around the country and I'm very happy about that. I think there can never be too many. Um, they're all a little bit different and I think that's what makes it wonderful. And I encourage people to, you know, try all, try bottom shelf stuff, try, you know, you don't have to spend a bunch of money to get a great whiskey. Um, these, the price point of these are a little bit higher now uh, Pogue is now at $110, which is kind of high. Um, and then Uncle Nearest is around $48, um, which I like to stay under $50 most of the time. But um, yeah, you don't have to spend a lot of money to get a great whiskey. What's the wild turkey that's super affordable and super high proof? 
is there 101 wild turkey? Yeah, like 101, Barry. Yeah, that's a good one. All yeah. the wild turkeys are great. Yeah. Yeah. And so, just, so affordable. So, and another tip that John Pogue gave us when he came up, uh, we asked him what his go to whiskey is. If he's not drinking his own stuff, what, what else would he drink? And he said, very old Barton, which we had never heard of. And so the next time we went home to visit my family, we went to the CVS in downtown, which is a drugstore in downtown uh, Louisville. And on the bottom shelf is very old Barton and it's $10 and it is the most delicious and sweet whiskey. <laughs> oh, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah. I, I think, I think that's the, one of the things that we get jealous about here in Ireland because we like before a, a bottle of spirits even hits a shelf here, it, it's basically 14 euro. So you can't, you know, there is no, bottom shelf so you can't get anything for ten dollars and there's some great stuff out in America out in the states and there's so many brands that you know we will we will obviously never see here but every time you see see a liquor store or see a picture of a liquor store in the US there's a, a plethora of different brands that are never gonna make it this side of the water but yeah you guys have a, a hell of a lot of choice there um to kind of work with as well which I think is great. And can I just make the point Barry that I made a joke on the stream there and I asked, was uh, was Edgar? I asked, was he any relation of Edgar Allan Poe? And I got two likes, right? And I thought that was a fantastic joke. I just want to make that so clearly. You know, there isn't a literary bone in in these people's bodies, and you know what I mean. I'm not sure. I'm you know, I'm just not sure anymore. No, thought, people don't know the difference between five likes. They can't tell. They don't know the difference between a Poe and a Pogue. <laughs> I was very upset. I was very upset. <laughs> Of course, pogue in Irish means kiss, and napogue, Irish whiskey, means hill of the kiss, and uh, pogue mahone means kiss my backside, and pogue is a well, well used Irish phrase. It is, it is, and it's usually the first uh, thing we teach to anybody who comes here on holidays is they ask us to teach them some Irish or some Gaelic, and it's generally pogue my pogue mahone, uh, yeah, which again means kiss my backside, but usually. It's it's told to people as this means hello in in Irish. So uh, the the L mischievous sense coming in there again. But yeah, I think Barry, what's your experience with bourbon though? I mean, what what is your experience with bourbon living in living in the United States? You're obviously an Irish whiskey man. You're representing it, but how do you feel about bourbon? I've had not enough experience with bourbon to be honest. Uh, Leanne and and Blair, her partner, have been uh, flying the flag for bourbon in Ohio. Um, for a long time, and I've been introduced to some American whiskeys through them. And but I, you know, I, I spent eight of the last ten years in Ohio, and I never did a single distillery tour down in Kentucky or Tennessee. When it would have been a anywhere from a three-hour drive to a seven-hour drive, I could have taken in all of the great distilleries of America, and I never did. So that's still on the list. Um, I'm not opposed to bourbon. I I found myself enjoying rye whiskeys more than more than corn-based whiskeys there's there's a sweetness to a bourbon that to me even though i like a sweet irish whiskey i prefer the sweetness that comes from a cask like a madeira or a the um a fortified wine like a marsala or a madeira sweetness uh, than an actual grain sweetness so that's what puts me off a bourbon saying that i love a good mixed drink with like a jack daniels or a you know, or a, a good rye whiskey. That would be my experience. So it's it's early days for me, 13 years after moving to America. Yeah, I think I think I see your point on rye because I think there is a good overlap with the spice of a rye overlaps well with pot still whiskey. Obviously, when we talk about pot still Irish whiskey, it's all about the, the spice and the, the creaminess. And I think there is a little bit of overlap. It's a different kind of spice, but there's definitely a spice there as well that can take your face off if you're not if you're not careful. Yeah, there absolutely is, yeah, yeah. I've had some lovely rye whiskeys that have tasted like a cup of coffee. There's like coffee yeah. rye, beautiful spice in them, yeah. And Leanne, then what about your experience with Irish whiskey? Where where do you sit on Irish whiskey? Has Barry converted you yet? Obviously um, not. Uh, actually, I I learn everything I know about Irish whiskey. I've learned from Barry. I've been to his tastings, and honestly, I didn't know that I liked Irish whiskey until uh, I went to Barry's tastings. Um, it, they're they're really great. Um, I love the red breast. I love the loose style. Um, they're they're wonderful whiskeys. But yeah. I, I don't know as I don't know as much about them. Um, like I said, I learned everything at Barry's tastings, which he does very well, by the way. 
Well, I mean, everything Barry says is probably a lie, so I mean, you can disregard me. That's okay, it's entertaining. <laughs> it uh, being Irish isn't that all that matters, really. And most uh, stories about that involve liquor are made up anyway. There are like 10 different stories of who made the old fashioned and who did whatever. So, because we're, we're all drinking and it's hard to remember. So, we we'll just yeah, make that. Okay. That is, that is, a, I, I a would like to, I'd like to chime in and mention Leanne and Blair have been flying the flag for whiskey and cocktails in Ohio for many years and have created amazing products and tours like uh, um, the, 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 the craft cocktail tour in Columbus, which they do, which is hopping around a number of bars where people get to experience craft cocktails, which is amazing. Leanne has created an amazing board game around bourbon. Like there's no end to Leanne's talent. She's on here um, flying below the radar, making us think that she's, you know, yeah, she's wearing an American flag, so we must listen to her. No, Leanne's got the chops here for bourbon and cocktails and whiskey, and, and we, we could all learn from uh, or could all benefit from listening to Leanne and her experience with whiskey. And uh, and, and Leanne has been, Leanne is the, the person that people ask, where, where stocks Pappy Van Winkle, or can I taste some of your Pappy Van Winkle? Because there's normally she'll have it on her bar cart, uh, or she'll keep the good stuff in the bedroom, but, but she'll always have it in the, in the apartment somewhere. I always share. Anyone who comes over, they can have whatever they like. If it's pappy, have some pappy. It's made for drinking, not saving. That is a, that is a hundred percent true. And as a Sazerac employee, I can tell you, my most hated question is, "Can you get me a bottle of pappy?" Because the answer is is absolutely not. No. Because <laughs> um, if I had one, I'd drink it myself, and I don't have any. So yeah. Well, the last time I asked Julian Van Winkle, he didn't return my email. So. I, I will say that when I was first getting introduced to bourbon um, through Leanne and Blair, uh, out of nowhere, I got this invitation from a friend who was a member of a, a private club in, in Ohio. And he said, hey, what are you doing tonight? There's this thing on in my club. I want you to come to it. He didn't tell me what it was, but I turned up there and it was a, a private Pappy Van Winkle tasting with one of the members of the, the Van Winkle family. And I had not experienced good bourbons, good American whiskeys at that stage. And it was a complete vertical tasting of the entire, the entire range. And I will say that I had just been, re at, at that stage, I was really just getting into Irish whiskey. And there was a moment, and I don't mind saying it here, I hope nobody's recording this or it's not available in the replays, but there was a moment when after sipping the 23 year old Pappy, I said to myself, there's no way anything can ever top this. And after I drained the glass, I asked the person, I asked my friend, I said, is it rude? to lick the inside of the glass. Like, is that, would that be considered a faux pas? And he said, you wouldn't be the first, you wouldn't be the last, because it was one of the greatest whiskeys I'd ever tasted. It was like eating a chocolate bar. It was that good. I just was blown away. Now, there are Irish whiskeys, I would argue, will go head to head with it. But at the time, that was like, I'd never taste anything like it. I know, Leanne, if you thought that was a particularly good one, or if you enjoyed that yourself, but blew me away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the 20 year, the 15 year, I mean, they're, they're all wonderful whiskeys and great people. And, um, you know, the, the secondary market is something um, that really bugs them. Um, it bugs, bugs everyone, I think, except for the people buying on the secondary market. But um, they, uh, they, they don't like the inflated prices. Uh, whenever I get a bottle, I pay regular retail price. Um, so it's just, it's just stupid. It, to, pay that much money for a bottle of whiskey is just insane. And I know Michael is keen to announce a winner of this battle of the, the nations tonight. But I have one more question for you, Leanne, because as I've learned about Irish whiskeys, or sorry, American whiskeys, the, the diversity of grains is just far more, it's far greater than we see in Ireland right now. Um, Pappy Van Winkle is made with wheat, isn't it? It's a wheat whiskey, or can you explain the wheat component? In, in, in American whiskeys, or is no, it corn? It's corn. No, it's corn. So bourbon has to be okay. made with fifty one percent corn, okay. and then That's there's right. there's always another grain. Um, if it's a wheat forward, it'll be wheat. If it's a rye forward, it'll be rye. Um, but then it also always has malted barley, which basically is just to help the uh, make use for its enzymes to break to break down the uh, the starches. So. Um, so no, it's 51% corn, like That's all right. it has to be. I've had a whiskey. 
if you'll excuse the idiotic questions, I've had a whiskey, so. That's all right. Cheers. Can I just, cheers. Can I, can I just say that I'm always reluctant for anyone to mention mash bills because I see Brendan Carty is on the, he, he's logged in there on the stream, Brendan of Cologne fame. And if you start mentioning mash bills, well, Barry, you think you can talk? There's a man, there's a man that can go all day. Um, but yeah, like you said, I am eager to announce a winner and, you know, then we can, we can deal with the fallout afterwards. So, I mean, should we get to it, Barry? Is this what we should do? Well, look, you, you have a bed to go to. I'm going to keep drinking Bushmills 21 and Leanne's welcome to stay on with me and drink with me as long as she wants and as long as you want too, Michael. But yeah, look, the floor is yours. You're the MC tonight. So you tell us yeah. what we should so, do here. I'll tell you what I have here and I, I've done this intentionally. You know, I have a bottle of Eagle Rare here, which I think is one of the, the finest bourbons available in Ireland. I have a bottle of Red Breast 12 here. So, I mean, which one am I going to pour? Whoever, whoever I pour is the winner. Um, and I think just based on me looking through the comments, and this, is, this, isn't, this isn't my decision, you know, I just want to make that clear that this is based on the comments, um, that there was a great battle that went on. I think in the, the spirit of the, the day that's in it, and there was a great spirit of camaraderie, and I think there's a lot of overlap between Irish and uh, American whiskey, and we can see there's a great camaraderie there. But I think the only winner on the day is going to be the Irish whiskey. So it's going to be... <laughs> well done, Leanne. Well done, Leanne. Great effort, guys. Great effort. Well done. Sloan to you, Leanne. Cheers. Cheers. Cheers to Michael for that tough decision. Very tough decision. And it was. It was. Um, will my wages still come through at the end of the month? I don't know anymore, Barry, after that decision. Like, they may not. <laughs> well, thank you for inviting well, me onto your platform. I really appreciate it. It was a lot of fun. This is a lot of fun. Like I, uh, you know, even though we, 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 we crushed American whiskey like a bug under our feast tonight, uh, I will say that, no, I'm just joking. Um, it's a lot of fun to, to talk about different styles, of, of different styles of whiskey because I always say I know only a small bit about Irish whiskey. I know even less about other whiskeys and I'm always eager to learn more and hearing the stories about bourbon and American whiskey remind us of the rich tapestry that whiskey makes across the world so it's uh there's no winners tonight we're all winners tonight there's no losers only whiskey winners. is the winner whiskey, whiskey is, the, is winner. the winner that's our, right. our guests are, are uh, the attendees of tonight's episode episode who paid nothing for this hour of entertainment are the winners really because this is the cheapest best value seat in the house uh, to have tonight on a friday night barry i i fully agree with you and it's always a pleasure to be invited on um, even though it is late on a Friday night, I don't mind. It, you know, it's great to, to share a whiskey with you guys on the far side of the Atlantic. You're a good man. You're a good man. A, a, an objective host, an MC, and uh, the only man that could have done this adequately with your feet in both uh, Irish and American territories. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, look, it's it was tough. It was hard, and I was guided by the people at the end of the day. You know, I stood out there on the platform behind you and, uh, you know, it was about you guys. It was about the whiskey and all I did was tally the votes. That was, that was all I did at the end of the day. And yeah, I think, I think whiskey was the winner. I, I will echo Brendan Carty, distiller, owner of the Killowen Distillery in Northern Ireland, doing incredible things. Brendan released today a new whiskey onto the market, a new 10-year-old experimental series whiskey, small batch whiskey. So congratulations to Brendan, who knows his recipes and his mash bills inside out. He has said something that I think we can all agree on. Leanne, thanks so much. You are a lady uh, and an absolute asset in the whiskey world and in the world generally. So slanja to you, Leanne. Slanja. Cheers. Joe says, paid nothing. Michael charged me a fiver for the link. <laughs> <laughs> what about making a few pounds on the side, Barry? Listen, you're welcome to grift off the uh, the bandwagon that is Stories and Sips. If you can make money off it, more power to you. <laughs> how, much, how much is it to send a turtleneck to Ireland? That's the real question. Well, um, 
I think you'll find that they're currently out of stock in the Stories and Sips shop, but they'll be restocked very shortly. <laughs> I tell you, you, you're starting a trend, pal. You're starting a trend. So we, we, the turtlenecks might make an appearance again if this weather gets a little bit cooler, but it'll always be there for special occasions. I, I can see Whiskey Live 2021. I can just see Dublin Convention Center in Ireland. I, I can just see a sea of turtlenecks everywhere. And it'll, it, why are we all wearing tur turtlenecks? And nobody will know, you know, but it, we'll know, Barry. We'll know it was you. It was it'd you, It'd be Barry. my proudest moment. I, I, you, you'd die happy after an event like that, if, if that was to happen, you know? The, the unofficial uniform of the Irish whiskey community is the turtleneck. We, Leanne, Leanne and I have, have, have a friend who always wears a fedora and Leanne knows who I'm talking about but a friend of mine and, and, and Leanne's and we all hang out in a group there one summer and he's wearing his fedora as he always would and then one of the days we were out having drinks another one of our friends showed up with a fedora and everybody looked at the second friend with the fedora and said you know it's just one fedora per group right and I think it's the same for turtlenecks <laughs> There's only one Irish whiskey turtleneck. Yeah, that's that's probably that's probably fair, Bar. Um, but I see there is a comment there to get a stories and sip logo with one of my shirts. And look, Barry, I'm open to doing a collaboration. I will design the shirt, um, and I won't charge you too much for it. Um, <laughs> if you think those turtlenecks are like hotcakes, my friend, wait, wait, wait until you see. Jamie says tur turtlenecks and tealing flat caps. It'll be a mixture of old Irishmen and new metrosexual Irishmen together. There we go. <laughs> I found this in my my, uh, my dad's cupboard. I am at home in Wexford, in the in the home place. I found this in a cupboard. So yeah. I will say that flat the flat cap is is a much worn uh, piece of head furniture by American tourists to Ireland. And I think, Michael, you'll agree that us Irish don't tend to wear too many of those flat caps, except when mm. we're on stage playing an Irishman. Yeah, I, exactly. And my head is far too small to wear hats anyway. Um, so I, I tend to steer, steer as clear away from them as I can. Jeff says he's saving up his millions for a turtleneck. So I jokingly put on my site last night that I would sell Stories and Sips turtlenecks for a million dollars. And I got seven or eight messages immediately saying, when's it available? Now, if I'm about to become a millionaire through the sale of a piece of fabric, I'm going to get on that fast. I mean, it seems like there's a demand at a million. The million dollars doesn't seem to have deterred people, which is very encouraging. Do you sell your T-shirts like the one you're wearing now? This is a, I just created this two days ago as a test. So I've not sold, we've not put them for sale yet, but I will have these t-shirts it's like irish whiskey fan um i have i have t-shirts on the way they're just not live in the store yet but yeah we will sell apparel because we got to pay these hosting fees <laughs> and you got to keep me in bushmills 21 you know <laughs> what what do you call the glasses that you drink out of they're not the glen karens but what is that called tua. it's called a tua tua glass which means like family or nation in irish and it's a uh, design for irish whiskey specifically and it's got a little pyramidal base. I'll send you some of these, Leanne, so you have them. Um, you need these on your shelf so that you can squeeze out any bourbon glasses. But it's got this pyramidal shape, um, which is shaped after the uh, island of Skellig Michael off the Dingle coast in Southwest Ireland. But it allows you to rest the glass on its side with a measure in it. Uh -huh. And also it's got a nice wide nose so people with pointy noses like me can actually get into the glass. Nice. And Michael. Yeah, no, I, I've seen, and my, my father is seen, uh, similarly blessed with the, you know, and I've seen him try to put his nose into a normal Glen Cairn and it doesn't work out for him. So these are ideal uh, for men who are particularly blessed in certain areas. The only glass that'll accept my nose. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll send you up some of those, Leanne, so you have these uh, to, to put your bourbon into. Are you selling branded ones now, Barry? I am. So... Uh, Thank, thanks for that prompt. Thanks for that, Michael. Uh, moving us very cleverly into a merchandise sale. But yeah, so yes, yesterday I I put this up on the. We, I launched a new website on storiesandsips.com, um, and we put a shop on there for the first time. So for the last two years, we've not asked for a penny. We've not had anything for sale. But 
now people have asked for uh, Stories and Sips merchandise, and so we put stuff up there. So we created the Stories and Sips box, and inside the box is the glassware and uh, a bunch of other things. So like we, if you open up the box, there's we shipped out a bunch of these today, but there's glasses, coasters. Amazing. There's, there's some toppers for your glass, some wooden toppers, some pipettes, um, and then some coasters that say important things like, in this house we drink Irish whiskey, or a, a really important one tonight, Leanne, in light of our win. <laughs> oh, <I will>. <laughs> <laughs> so funny. if anybody wants these, you can go to storiesandsips.com or shopstoriesandsips.com. Well, Barry, yeah. I, I'm, all about, I'm all about helping you out. And what I'd like to do is um, for the low, low price of my flights, uh, accommodation and some walking around money, I'm willing to allow you to put on your site a, an evening with Michael. Um, so just flights, first class, uh, walking around money, you know, and my accommodation. And I uh, post-COVID, obviously, post-COVID. Um, I'm, I'm happy, happy to come see anybody. That, that's a very reasonable gesture and, and, and very, it seems very generous of you. Can you explain the phrase walking around money and quantify it in some understandable measure? Well, you know, so I'm in, um, where, where are you currently, Barry? Is it Ohio or is it in California now? I'm in California currently. So I'm in California. We're out. Um, you know, we, we meet for a drink. I want a Redbreast 21. I want a Bushmills 21. I need some walking around money to be able to buy that, you know? And similarly, to buy some tacos, you know? So tacos and a <laughs> Essentially, three servings of those a day for the period that I am in the United States and I'm happy. And accommodation and, and first class flights. I, I'm always delighted when people know their worth. And for the price of a few tacos and a glass of whiskey, Michael is available to you. So just, just so you know. Yeah. Know your worth. Know your worth. <laughs> Leanne, if, if tacos are what would be consumed for with, with walking around money in California, what would Michael do with walking around money in Ohio? Uh, I don't know. Have you been to Ohio, Michael? I, I have never been to Ohio. Is the, the NFL Hall of Fame is in Ohio? Is that, is that, that's the, one of the only things I think I know about it. I have absolutely no idea. I don't know anything about sports. <laughs> it is. It is. <laughs> uh, we, we, I remember we did a, we did a lecture in, in college, and it was American presidents, and it was um, Taft, I believe, was from Ohio. Yeah. And someone mentioned they'd been there, and they'd been to the NFL Hall of Fame. So literally... That's that's the sum total of my experience with with Ohio. I'm afraid. I know the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is in Cleveland. Well, there you go. That's right. I mean, Much yeah. more fun than the NFL Hall of Fame, I would think. I've never yeah. been to either yeah. of these yeah. halls of fame. Um, Canton, Ohio, Andrew says, is where the NFL Hall of Fame is. I didn't know that it was there. Um, that's interesting. I've done a whiskey tasting on a lake in Canton, Ohio, of all places. Uh, and that's actually very fun tasting. You have some life. You have some life, Barry. We have great bars here, Michael, with amazing bartenders. No, for sure. It's uh, it's certainly, you know, uh, I need to get over and see more states. I've been to about four states in the US, and that's about it. But hopefully at some point, make it back over. And uh, listen, walking around money. That's all I'm asking for, guys. Well, Michael, there's never been a better time to to invest in some tourism as right now, uh, mm. when everywhere is open and ready to receive you. I think now would be a good time to buy a ticket. Christ, <laughs> <laughs> rock bottom. Okay. I mean, look, I'm just I'm just throwing out options to the people of the United States. Andrew asks if Myers Lake Myers Lake is where I did the tastings. So there's a bunch of like there's a whole bunch of homes built. It's an artificial lake. It was it was created artificially. I think it's Myers Lake. And there's hundreds of homes and snakes around. We did a tasting on the lake uh, there last week. Or not last week, last year. I had a great old time. And they were looking to do another one, actually, in the next few weeks. But it is a tough old time to be uh, to be doing in-person whiskey tastings, as you well know. Both of you well know, uh, Michael and Leanne. Uh, Leanne, your, your craft cocktail tour, I'd like to give a bit of a plug to it. Um, you were doing that in person, obviously, uh, yeah. up until a few months ago. Tell us 
what has happened in the past few months with your craft cocktail tour? Oh, well, it just died out in March. And so we, we had to refund all of the ticket sales, um, which stung a little bit, but, um, you know, we try to do some virtual tours. We did one virtual tour, which was amazing. Um, we had three amazing bartenders. They made the cocktails ahead of time and then we delivered them to the guests. And then we did a, a zoom, uh, cocktail tour where they explained and showed, demonstrated how they made the cocktail. Um, so that was really fun, but, uh, we don't know when we're going to be able to get back to it. We're waiting on the bars to let us know. Uh, but some of our bars are shutting down again because there's been a new surge with the pandemic. So, uh, you know, we just want them to be safe. Um, also, I was doing the women and whiskey events at the Westin Hotel and the Westin has been closed down since March and they have no date to reopen. So, you know, luckily we have day jobs, so it's not affecting us. But, uh, you know, our hearts really go out to our bartenders, uh, we're trying, we're doing everything we can to support them financially during this time. Um, getting carry out cocktails, which is a great thing that just, uh, is something new in Ohio, um, which is great for them. So, uh, yeah, support your local bartenders by buying gift cards and, um, getting carry out cocktails if that's allowed in your area. So both of you have been are right now involved in bartender related fundraising because um, Leanne, you talked about some of the things you're doing with virtual tipping and virtual gift cards, et cetera. Michael, same thing is happening. I know Paddy is leading the charge in Ireland. Tell us a little bit about what you're doing in Ireland for bartenders. Yeah, so uh, in, in the association with the, the Restaurant Association of Ireland, the Paddy are actually running the largest virtual tip chart and up to a value of about 20 of 20,000 euro we're matching the donations for people in the hospitality industry because same as that they've been closed for 13 weeks now at this point um and a lot of people have gone back to work this week thankfully but bars are at you know much restricted in terms of the amount of people they're allowed in so certainly there are some staff who still haven't been able to come back to work um and the the government has a, a payment at the moment for people who are laid off due to coronavirus and or COVID. Um, but it, it's not it's not indefinite and it's not forever. But it's good to see some of the guys getting back to work this week and hopefully everyone just stays safe and we can kind of start coming back to some sort of normality. Um, I was in some bars during the week and they all have the plexiglass up and you know people are starting to wear masks and stuff now as well. So look we, we deal with it day by day but um yeah certainly the the hospitality industry in Ireland we are a massive country uh, or sorry, we are a country massively um, based on hospitality. And I think it's really important to support local and support home. I mean, okay. I'm looking at any holidays that I'm going to spend in Ireland between now and, or any holidays that I have, I'm going to spend in Ireland between now and, you know, the foreseeable future, certainly. As part of our um, cocktail tour, at the end of every tour, we ask our guests to tell us what their fan favorite, their favorite of the night was. We call it our fan favorite cocktails. And so we always post a picture of it with the recipe on our website, but we've been compiling those. And so we are creating a cocktail book um, that we're going to sell. We're going to pay to to publish it. And then uh, all the proceeds will go to the bartenders who have recipes in the book. So hopefully it'll sell well and give them a little bit of, of money. So just, you know, whatever you can do, got to get creative during these crazy times, but we'll make it through. Yeah, th I think the only thing we can do is all kind of stick together, all support one another and just try and try and make it through because, you know, like you said, totally unprecedented. I think that's an amazing initiative. Make sure Barry shares out that link for you because uh, I, I know certainly there'll be a good few people in Ireland who are interested to try those things as well. Awesome. Yeah, Le Leanne, once you've got uh, more details on that, we'll put it out through stories and sips as well so people can participate. But yeah, you're right. Like bartenders are feeling it. Uh, Colleen, who's in Ohio, mentions at the bar she used to, Servat is now permanently closed, and sadly, I think we're going to see more of that. And uh, it's it's a very it's an unreal time, and I, I'll be the first to say that on a daily basis, I'm reevaluating life. You know, like you you find yourself staring into a glass, wondering what what next. You know, what, how do we approach this new world, and what should we do differently and the same? And um, it's it's very strange world for many people. And so, yeah, whatever we can do to pull together, uh, I've always maintained whiskey, especially brings people together. So if we can find ways for whiskey to raise money to do things for other people maybe there's 
I, I'm maybe I'm sensing maybe there's more for stories and sips to be involved with in the future too. Yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, local restaurants have and bars have done some fun uh, inventive things. Uh, Veritas, um, they started selling off their uh, their wine selection, and they're doing uh, sommelier curated uh, wine collections that you could buy, and they're doing tastings online, and so it's a really great excuse to buy bottles that you wouldn't necessarily purchase. Um, we've got a bottle of Dom and a bottle of uh, Grand, Dam, Grand Dom uh, Clicquot, which it was expensive, but when all of the money goes to the bartenders, why not, you know? Um, and then bottle the bottle shop on King Avenue, um, she's been doing uh, curated wine boxes, um, which are fabulous. She's, she's a wonderful, um, she know, she's so knowledgeable about wine. Everything that I've gotten from her um, has been fabulous. She does Italian wines, French wine, bubbles, um, natural wines, um, and everything. Nothing has disappointed so far. Well, Michael, I know it's, it is 1.30 in the morning in Ireland. Um, at, this is the time of the night where I say to you, you're welcome to leave at any time. Um, you are welcome to log off if you're and you, but you're as as welcome well no a little bit less welcome to stay but you're welcome to leave at any time because i know it's late but just i want to give you that out because it is late and we ask a lot of people when they're joining from ireland i'll, I'll tell you what i'll do barry i'll finish this one off and i'll, I'll All good. way into the night then for you okay, right? fair, fair play um leanne I, i've got another question for you so you share two whiskeys tonight um i know that I solicited advice from people who know far more about Irish whiskey than I do to suggest what I should arrive at tonight for my whiskeys. There were many that made the shortlist down to, I had it down to like five or 10 ultimately that we're going to, I was going to choose from. I'll share a little bit about my kind of choosing process in a second, but I'd be curious from your side, were there other whiskeys that would have made maybe third or fourth in your selection uh, coming to the table tonight? You know, I, I actually had considered uh, Maker's Mark. Um, admittedly, I don't drink it that often, but whenever I do, I'm like, damn, that's good. And in every single blind tasting that our club has done when Maker's Mark has been one of the blind uh, tastings, it, it wins out. It's just, it's a consistently delicious whiskey. So I thought about that. Um, and then I also thought about Wilderness Trail, which is a great new whiskey. Um, they're in Danville, Kentucky. They're amazing people. Um, they've become good friends. They've come up and, and presented at our, our bourbon club as well. Um, that's another really great one. Um, yeah, there's an Angel's Envy I love. You know, there are just so many, so many wonderful ones to choose from. But yeah, ultimately, I stuck with Pogue and Uncle Diggers, which are awesome. Barry, I will take this as my opportunity to sign off. You know, it's been a pleasure. Leanne, it's been an absolute pleasure to meet you. All right, virtually. Michael, anyway. you've been a gent, an absolute gent, a legend. You are uh, for giving us your time um, for no money whatsoever. No money has traded hands in the uh, creation of this, despite what I promised you earlier, what? that check has been cancelled. So tear um, it up when you get it. But, but, <laughs> but, but, I'm unsure. Actually, just as an aside there, um, Dahi from uh, WD O'Connell sent me a message there and he said, any chance of getting getting a bottle into shot there at any point? Um, but I haven't got on me. Uh, if you've got a bottle of Bill Phil, throw it up there. You probably don't either. But I told I him do. Next time, do you have one? He, just throw he, it he in the shot there. He'd love he it. wants a plug in shot. Dahi oh, he, is he's, he's, dis, he's disgraceful for his requests, but we'll, we'll honor it. He's unbelievable. It's a fine pair of shorts. Fine pair of legs on you as well, Barry. <laughs> right, put this in shot. There we go, Dahi. Um, free advertising for Dahi. He's a good man. Dahi's trying to get his whiskey over here to America at the moment, and we wish him well. But this is a peated single malt that is uh, three years and some months old and it is a by all accounts a very good peated whiskey 
I would be the wrong person to ask because I despise peated whiskey, but I will yeah, uh, exactly. get closer to it, maybe. Uh, I've been trying. But in any case, check out no. WD O'Connell. I know Stacey Stearns, who's on here. I saw her in the comments. There she is. Bill Phil, her husband's favorite. She bought it for her husband, Devin, um, which is great, who was a Connemara fan, and he's now been converted to WD O'Connell. Bill Phil. Listen, thank you very much for that, Barry. He'll, he'll appreciate that, I know. He, he's only from over the border, uh, from me. Uh, I'm, I'm in North Wexford. He's just across in Carlow originally, so he'll appreciate that. But listen, thanks very much for your, your time. Michael, Hopefully. thank you, Michael. You're, listen, you're a gentleman. Let's launch it. Let's launch it, Michael. Thank you. That is Michael Cowman, a great whiskey man and uh, a man who knows his Irish whiskey and his American whiskey uh, very well. So, Leanne, that was a battle. That was a, a a battle of the nations. You you did America proud, I have to say. You are so – you were just a natural at that. You, you are amazing. You did, I, I, knew, I knew there was no way I was going to beat the great Barry Chandler. Um, no, you're, no, you're just no. a wonderful presenter. Wonderful. As I said before, I don't do much of the work. I only open the bottles. It is the whiskey makers that do all the hard work and make it easy for me to sing about them. I only pop the corks and drink them, you know? <laughs> um, tell me, Leanne, the, what was I, I was asking before, Michael, oh yes, the, the, the other choices. You had those other choices, the whiskeys. Um, I wanted to talk, because I know people asked me earlier the criteria I used to judge which whiskeys I was going to end up with. So I was trying to figure out, would I, there was a few things, a few questions I had to answer. Was it going to be an old historic whiskey from one of the big distilleries? Was it going to be a new whiskey that's from a new, not even a distillery, but maybe a whiskey bottler or a bonder? Was it going to be um, something unusual, like a peated whiskey, like the W.D. O'Connell, Bill Phil? And what I boiled it down to was that, was, was a few things. The first was that it had to be readily available in the United States. And that's where Red Breast 12, Cast Strength and Bushmills 21 came in. The two whiskeys couldn't be ridiculous car payment money style whiskeys. And I have a few of those on the shelf, but they're ridiculous. This one, Red Breast 12, Cast Strength is $79.99. It's expensive. There's no doubt about it, but it is for what you get a very affordable pot of whiskey and Bushmills. I got this for 129 you can find it for anywhere from that to 300, unfortunately. But um, this was my big hitter. So I wanted to choose whiskeys that came from distilleries that have laid the groundwork for new distilleries and brands to come along. So that's where I landed with Redbreast and Bushmills. It wasn't that these are the best whiskeys in Ireland. I mean, that's a subjective term. I think everyone has their own. Um, but rather, it was what I thought best represented Ireland against bourbon. I knew I had to have a cask strength whiskey to go up against the typical barrel proof that bourbon presents us with. So uh, those are my criteria. Um, did you have criteria beyond your, your personal connection when you were thinking about this? Not really, just because I there are so many that I love. It's I, Somebody asked me um, a couple of weeks ago, what's your favorite whiskey? I have no idea. I don't, I don't really have a favorite because I love them all. Um, I don't. I mean, there are some that I don't love, but um, but I really enjoy them all. And you know, they all have different characteristics, and um, there's something to love about just about all of them. So, so no, I just pick the ones that uh, that I'm personally connected to, or I feel personally connected to. So, and Uncle Nearest, it's such a beautiful story, and I would encourage everyone to go out and buy a bottle. It comes with a little book attached to it. Um, that tells the story of Uncle, Uncle Nearest in a very beautiful way. Um, and go to their distillery. It's open now mm -hmm. in uh, Shelbyville, Tennessee. They converted a, a horse farm and they kept some of the horses in the stables, but it's a massive distillery um, that's quite beautiful. So get I down. feel like that, that the story of, of Uncle Nearest, I first came across it. Um, through a New York Times article talking about the forgotten distiller, really. And, and it, it, 
it feels like it's not been that long since that article came out, which I know drew a lot of attention to to the plight of, of Uncle Nearest himself and his how how removed he was from or how he was removed or um, whitewashed out of the history of, of Jack Daniels. It, it seems like they've got that distillery up and running fairly quickly. Yeah, but so actually that New York Times article was what spurred uh, Fawn Weaver to go to Lynchburg and, uh, and investigate it more. Um, she read the article, was curious, and she told her husband for her 40th birthday that she wanted to go to Lynchburg, Tennessee. And she tells the story that um, it was a hard sell because they are African-American and trying to get your African-American husband to take you to Lynchburg, Tennessee for your 40th birthday was, uh, that was difficult, but he agreed. And so when she started interviewing uh, the townspeople and, and his relatives, um, it's a very small town so that everybody knows everybody. Um, but it was no secret there um, about Uncle Nearest. He was revered, uh, he was respected, he was wealthy. Um, his family um, still work for Jack Daniels Distillery. Um, Jack Daniels Distillery has a, uh, a display of Uncle Nearest. Huh? Yeah, and uh, Fawn Weaver has actually set up a fund uh, for the descendants of uh, Uncle Nearest. So the sale, a portion of the sales of all that whiskey goes to a fund for his his ancestors. And it's really cool. Uh, Sherry Moore drove us all around the town and it's a one stoplight town. And she took us to the cemetery where Jack Daniels is buried. And there's a, uh, a small memorial for Jack and, and a bench. And then she drove us around to uh, Uncle Nearest's um, grave site. And there's this huge monument and they have uh, charcoal, the, uh, uh, a vase or an urn with charcoal filled uh, in it because he uh, perfected the Lincoln County process. But mm. it was really touching that his monument was so much larger than uh, Jack Daniels' monument. So, yeah, that's uh, interesting. And, and one of the questions that Fawn Weaver asked to a teacher in town was, um, you know, what was it like when the schools were integrated? And the teacher looked at her and she said, what do you mean integrated? And, and Fawn explained it to her and she was like, no, that never happened here. Like we've always all been together. We, we embrace each other. We, there's no difference. So we can all learn a lesson from the people of Lynchburg, Tennessee, really. That's amazing. I'd like to go down and see that. Um, and I love this story. And I was in, Melinda and I were in um, in LA just about three or four weeks before this lockdown happened, and we went into this cocktail bar, and they had many whiskeys on the uh, on the shelves, and we were asking them, you know, what do you recommend? I wanted to go do something different, and very proudly, the bartender brought over a bottle of Uncle Nearest, and he yeah. said, "Let me tell you the story of this," and he was so proud of just sharing. He thought this is an important thing beyond the whiskey alone. I want I want to make sure you know this. Yeah. And uh, I, I didn't hint that I had any inkling of the story. I just let him share it with gusto, and he did. And I, I, I think that's lovely that we can use whiskey to restore um, and honor those that have been the ones that perhaps laid the groundwork for it to become a great whiskey in the first place. So yeah. uh, great to see it getting attention finally. Yeah, yeah, it, it really is a wonderful thing. And and thank goodness for Fawn Weaver. Um, because she really brought this to light and um, it, it's amazing what she has done. She's truly an amazing person for, for doing this. And like you said, they, they worked very fast in, in getting the distillery up. We visited it two years ago and it was, it was just a shell of an old uh, stable horse farm and uh, they really turned it into something very beautiful. And, and they'll start making their own spirits. And then of course it's got to age for a while. So, um, right. you know. That's interesting. Yeah, it's it's great to see to see that up and running and, and I'm sure it'll have a, it'll become a big attraction in years to come. No oh, doubt yeah. about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, one question, Leanne, before I let you go, you've been very generous with your time. Uh, we've had a lot of fun tonight. 
Uh, a lot of people really interested in the history, the stories you've been sharing. You've got a lot of fans here tonight. And uh, well, two things I want to do. One is I want to share on the screen and it'll be available to those who watch the replay. Where can anybody find out more about the things that you're doing? What, what website would you like me to send people to? Uh, Columbus Craft Cocktail Tour.com. Columbus Craft Cocktail Tour.com. Let me put that up there. Columbus Craft Cocktail Tour.com. There we go. Perfect. So please check out Leanne and Blair, what they're doing there uh, on the Columbus Craft Cocktail Tour. Um, there was a question that I thought you'd be, we don't often get questions about American whiskey because we shun them and we <laughs> bar people from the room for mentioning their very name. But uh, let me see, Richard asks, what would you think are the staple Americans, whiskeys or bourbons that people should have on their shelves? What would you recommend is a good American shelf? Um, well, I think start with Maker's Mark. Um, I would say Old Grandad uh either 114 wild uh wild turkey um yeah i think mm. that's a good start buffalo, buffalo trace maybe very affordable entry into the whiskey world too yeah yeah which is amazing wilderness trail old pogue uncle nearest <laughs> no no shortage to choose from <laughs> yeah that's for sure but you know i i would say just just buy a bunch of different ones and or go to a bar and get a flight. And, um, and like I said before, don't go by the tasting. Don't go by what other people taste. Taste what you taste, what you feel on your palate and what you enjoy. Make a note of that. And then you know that's what you like or what you don't like. Um, so don't, don't follow someone else's notes. Follow your own notes. Um, I, I'm never going to taste orange blossom in a whiskey. I just don't. Um, so find your flavor and, uh, and go with that. Well, I think that, um, you've, you've introduced some Irish fans into the world of, uh, American whiskeys, which is, uh, which is always a good thing. Uh, we should all broaden our horizons and our palates. And I hope more people, uh, come to, uh, find the whiskeys that they love, whether they're Irish or American. I don't mind as long as they're Irish. Um, <laughs> Clump ColumbusCraftCocktailTour.com is where you can find out more details and get in touch with Leanne. If you've got any questions, I'm sure she'll answer them. Uh, Leanne, I want to thank you for your time tonight and for uh, your time in preparing for tonight. A lot of preparations got into tonight. Uh, sadly, there was, well, there was an, one winner announced, but I'm going to say that it's a shared win for both of us that we get to share our love for whiskey and the stories behind it tonight, which I think is, uh, is, is more important than anything. So... Uh, so slauncha and cheers to, to, to that. Cheers. Thank you. It was so much fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks a million, Leanne. And I know Blair is hiding in the corner there. So thanks to you as well, Blair. He's uh, <laughs> he's behind the behind the camera. He, he might give us a wave or something. But uh, <laughs> thanks to both of you for uh, for there he is. <laughs> um, so yeah. So listen, I will uh, I will let you get on with your your evening. Thanks so much for for participating. Thank uh, you. I'm. Maybe we'll have a chance to do something else like this in the future. Maybe there's something we can do with bartenders and create some kind of online event like this that might be some kind of fundraiser uh, for, for bars. That could be something we could put our heads together on. Wonderful. All right. Thanks again. It was fun. Great to see you. Best to Melinda. Great to see you, Leanne. Thanks, Blair, as well. Talk to you soon, both of you. Amazing. Great to have Leanne on. I've known Leanne and a partner, Blair, for many, many years, and if there was one person that's going to talk about bourbon and American whiskey, it was Leanne. So I'm really, really appreciative of her joining in. Um, so, uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks to you all for uh, sticking with this for so long. Um, great session. Of course, there can only be one winner, and that is Irish whiskey. Don't you know it? We are the number one whiskey in the world, according to me. And now, according to tonight's live stream. We did it. We won. We beat out the competition. Um, it was all in good fun, good jest, and Leanne was a good sport about it. Um, so, yeah, great stuff. Uh, thanks, everybody, for, for your comments and for joining in. Let me know what you're drinking. I'm still – I've look, I've been working my way through this bottle. It was full when I opened it. I'm, what, one-sixth of the way through it now.
I'm going to stick around for a little bit longer. If anybody wants to chat, have some questions, tell me what's in your glass, tell me what, what's going on with you. Um, I had a couple of questions there just briefly. and I don't want to spend too much time on it, um, but there was a couple of questions about uh, shipping this, uh, this box outside of the United States. So there was a question about shipping it to Canada. So for those of you that are just joining, that we launched our Stories and Sips box this week, just yesterday, in fact, and we've spent our day today shipping out those that were ordered yesterday. So thanks to everybody who's ordered it. This is our Stories and Sips box. Glassware, coasters, glass toppers to prevent your whiskey from evaporating. Lots of goodies in here um, to show um, that you are an Irish whiskey fan and a supporter of Irish whiskey. Some coasters like this that uh, I think should adorn every every shelf and every worktop but yeah the question was whether these are available and the stories and sips glasses outside of the united states currently our shop is just set to ship to the united states but it looks like we've got some fans in canada that want to ship to canada um i'm going to change the settings in the store and i'll message you so that it can ship to canada the sad thing is that right now it would be very expensive to ship it to ireland and i don't know if that's going to be something that would make financial sense for you when you're buying it, but I'll look into it to see. But the challenge is that even here in the United States, so I offer this with free shipping, 100% free shipping when you buy the box. I still have to pay $15 on a box to ship it. Uh, and if I have to ship it to Ireland, it'll cost probably 30 or $40 to get it to Ireland, which might be prohibitive. So we'll look into it. That's all we can say. Um, Maureen, we have your, we, we got your message there. Thanks for that. We'll get this to Canada. There's, uh, we'll figure, we'll, we'll, we'll change the settings and I'll send you a link. We'll, we'll get it to Canada. Um, so, yeah. Uh, Michael asks, interestingly, Michael is still there. Michael left our stream because he, he'd rather sit in the background and heckle. But he, he, the, no sooner was he out of the screen than he put this comment in. He said he's still up. His dad just walked in and asked why he has a baseball bat. I told him I'm interviewing for a job. He nodded and <laughs> backed out of the room. <laughs> That's a fantastic visual. <laughs> But he follows that up with a question. If I was a whiskey, what whiskey would I be? If I was a whiskey, what whiskey would I be? I'd probably be a single pot still. Let's start this narrowing process because there's a, I'd be kind of spicy and sharp at one side, but I'd be quite accommodating and comforting at the other side so that I have that creaminess of a pot still with a spiciness of a pot still and I'd probably have a bit of a historic context to me so in that case if I was to be a whiskey today I could really only be a green spot or a red breast so I'd probably have to be a red breast 12 year old because I'd be available to the masses there's enough of Barry to go around and then I'd be that nice balance of spice and uh, smooth mellow creaminess with some nice Christmas fruits. Any good? That's what I'd be. <laughs> Michael's a heckler. Chris says he'd be a pot still. So let me see, what else are you drinking? Chris Connor's drinking Tully 14 year old single malt to their friend. Slauncha, slauncha to, to you and your friend. I'm gonna put up that link here for those of you that want that shop, you asked for the link. Um, that's the link there. If you want those glasses, let me know. And um, we shipped out a bunch of them today, by the way. And we're going to ship out more on Monday. So July 4th weekend, obviously, the post office is closed tomorrow. We'll ship out more of them. We have hundreds of glasses here right now, but we had to place a second order because of the demand over the last 24 hours. I can't thank you enough for the support. It's been a real labor of love. Mrs. Stories and Sips is over there behind the camera. She'll never come in front of it because she she's the brains of the operation. And she pushes me out in front. So she's the creative genius that creates all the videos and the images that promoted the box when we launched it yesterday. Uh, but there's mo we have we had to place a second order for glassware, for engraving, for toppers, such was the um, the rush yesterday. So really, thank you so much for that. We have more things coming, like this shirt, right? Like this was a test. I wanted to order this shirt so that people could, so I could see what it was like, Irish whiskey fan. We've got more of these things coming, like just a bit of fun really, but Look, we're a community now. We're building a community of people that rally around Irish whiskey and rally around stories and sips and connect here every Friday and join tastings online. And we're hanging out in our Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. We need team colors, right? We need tools of the trade. We need glassware to drink together. That's why these things are available. So 
look, we've got the sip box and the super sip box, depending on how many glasses you want. So yeah, go to shop stories and sips .com if you have any interest. And if not, there's no stress at all. It's just for many people, they want to get access to the, those, uh, those two glasses. I'm not going to spend my live streams promoting those because this isn't supposed to be a sales pitch, but rather just saying, I'm kind of proud of what we've put out here. I think this, the quality is amazing. It's taken us longer than expected to put this stuff out because the first shipment of coasters we got were in no way suitable for you guys. They just weren't. We had to dump them all. We lost a bit of money on them. We threw them all out. We started again because the first lot was just garbage. So what we've got today, I think Mrs. Stories and Sips would agree with a little wave. We're very proud of them. She's an amazing logistics coordinator in the background, head of merchandise, Mrs. Stories and Sips. But I think this product speaks for itself. Anyway, not too much of a pitch, just saying I'm proud of it and I'm going to keep toasting you with these glasses and you know where to find them. As simple as that. Way to go, Melinda, says Maureen. Woo! That's right. Uh, Michael would be a bottle of George T. Stag because he'll take your face off if you're not careful. <laughs> Jeez, that escalated very quickly, Michael. Michael's the kind of fellow that you're out for a few drinks and suddenly he's standing over you with a shovel. Take it back. <laughs> well, Michael, I mean, that's very aggressive, but we're, you're, you're open to your opinions there. <laughs> Andrew says he likes the mystery. Uh, we like the mystery of not seeing the misses. Yeah. Well, if you saw the misses, you'd realize that I'm the, the cheaper option, that I'm the, uh, the, the second act, uh, and she's the one who should really be here. And uh, it would instantly cheapen my presentation if she was even glimpsed once. So um, she'll stay mysterious behind the scenes and very kindly make me look good out here. <laughs> Thanks, Andrew, for saying we're, you're proud of us. And Maureen says, we're happy to support you all the time and effort you both put in. Thanks so much. Look, it's a labor of love. We love it. If we never made a penny from it, it's no problem. Like, we're just loving this. I love the crack. But I think we're building a community here where we can do great things. And this is just the start. This Friday night lock-in is only the beginning. And for many of you, you've been around a lot longer than the Friday night lock-in. We've had in-person events and virtual events before that, and we'll do many more things. So hopefully you're all part of the, um, the Irish Whiskey Fans of America Facebook group. If you're not, please join in there. Um, there are 5,100, almost 5,200 people in there now. We're growing fairly quickly, and that's a great thing. It's a moderated group. Let me put up the link. It's a moderated group, which means I get notifications if people post stupid things. It rarely happens, but when they do, they're instantly deleted and removed. It's a community. It's not a sales pitch. It's, um, it's about respect and inquisitiveness and trying to learn more about whiskey and Irish whiskey. So it's a bit of crack. And uh, it's a fab fabulous community. I'm learning things from it every day. And people have lots of questions about Irish whiskey and other people answer them. So if you've got questions, go find that group, jump in there. I'd love you to become a member. It's, uh, it's a lot of crack. Um, so yeah, so that is uh, Irish Whiskey Fans of America. The comments are coming in fast here. How do I keep up? And um, six six glasses of Bushmills in. I have to say, if you haven't ever tried this, it is unbelievable. It is Mrs. Stories and Sips' favorite Irish whiskey. It's my favorite single malt uh, of all time. I'd had it years ago, not that many years ago. I think it only came out in 2016. But we were up in Portland, Oregon. When were we in Portland, Oregon? Love. Do you last fall and we went to a bar called the scotch lodge scotch lodge right i think it was the scotch lodge and they had an amazing selection of whiskies irish whiskey scotch and i saw this bushmills 21 on the shelf and i had only barely sampled it and it was one of those nights where you know the nights where you feel like era let's have something special tonight you know you felt like you had a good day and you want you're willing to put your hand in your pocket and treat yourself and we had a couple of these a couple of bushmills 21 well we nearly fell off the seats we left there with a hefty barbell, but a smile on our faces. And ever since then, we've ensured we have a bottle of Bushmills 21 in the house. Uh, and today at the price, I found this. I found this at the price of two measures that you'd get in a bar, really. Uh, and such was the deal that I got this at. I bought two of them. So that is something that I will treasure and sip on slowly 
It is absolutely amazing, a fantastic single malt. I'm going to do an interview, hopefully, over the next few weeks with somebody from Bush Mills because it's a story that's uh, often overlooked because Middleton Punch is so big with their red breast and their pot whiskies, uh, or sorry, spot whiskies and powders and Jameson. But Bush Mills have some incredible things in their stable and more coming too. Um, let me see. James says, I've married up. James, I knew that the day I met her. I knew that the day I met her. Absolutely. Chris says, we can make 5,300 members. We can. Um, I think we're the, one of the biggest Facebook groups in the world for Irish whiskey now, and we'll soon become the biggest. And uh, I think we're the only real community. The other group has a lot of, a lot of people posting stuff that's not related to... Uh, to, to Irish whiskey, but oh look, there, there's a hand coming over the computer. What's it looking for? Can I see the hand? Oh look, did you catch a glimpse of the hand? I right, show your hand over the over. Oh, show your hand. Oh look, here it comes. There you go. <laughs> Mrs. Stories and Sips determined to have her share of the poor. Absolutely. <laughs> MP says he's never seen me so tipsy. You know what? I've decided with these live streams, it's time to really get into it. It's time to have a few drinks beforehand. And, um, you know, I mean, I've been thinking about these live streams over the past few weeks. There's, I think you'd all agree in the world of whiskey and other worlds, there's no shortage of content being produced virtually of interviews and people being interviewed and live streams and content. And I don't want, and I, I, many things are copied and I, the goal always with this was let's have the crack. And I think that some of my live streams, I've not have, I've not had as much crack. And the only reason I've not had as much crack is because I've created a format for some of those live streams where I've interviewed in ways that aren't full of crack. So why I'm enjoying tonight and I may seem tipsy is because I'm kind of tipsy on the high of having a good time, really the crack with, with whiskey um, when I have fun events like this. So I want to do more events that are around the crack and having a good time because that's what Irish whiskey is about. There's plenty of places where you can find detailed technical interviews. I'm not here to compete. I'm here to congratulate others who are doing those and fair play to people who put in the time and effort often with no uh, expectation of reward. Uh, and there's plenty of those out there. We're not a review site. We're not an interview site uh, or a news site per se. It's about having the crack and bringing people together. So expect more events like this. Expect more having the crack. That's what it's all about. Uh, so yeah, if I seem on top of the world tonight, it's because of that. <laughs> Maureen says, let loose. Tell us how you really feel about Irish whiskey. Andrew wants me to sing a song. Melinda says, yeah, sing a song. Should we sing a song? We've never sang a song on the live stream before. Um. So there's one song that I do at all the tastings, and it's called The Owl's Triangle. Does anybody know The Owl Triangle? It's, it's The Owl Triangle. It was made famous by Ronnie Drew from the Dubliners. Um, let me put in here The Owl Triangle. Um, and uh, Glenn Hansard does a version of it. Many bands do a version of it, but every in-person tasting I do, we sing the Owl Triangle and we break the room into groups and everybody gets a verse and everybody has to sing it. And, everybody, and then as a group, we all sing the chorus together and it's a lot of fun. It's a bit of crack. And uh, we've, never, we've never done it on the live stream, but maybe tonight is the night for the Owl Triangle. What do you think? There's some enthusiastic nodding from the corner now. Um, all right, we're going to do the Owl Triangle. We're going to do it. But do what? Oh, yes. Put the lyrics up. All right. So let me put the lyrics up here. Let me Google them first, and I'll paste them onto the screen. We'll put them up verse by verse. All right. You put me on the spot here, but we're going to do it. We're going to do it. I'm going to do the original Dubliners version of this. Okay, All right, so just testing to make sure I can add in the lyrics here. Yes, we can, okay. All right, 
I will. I'll tell the story of it as well. Melinda's doing a great job. Mrs. Stories and Sips doing a great job of being my auto cue, my prompt over here. This is one for the books. We've not done it before. We might have to end every live stream with this. All right, we've got four verses that we're going to put in here. Okay. Um, it looks like we've got some interest. Uh, Andrew asks if Mrs. Stories and Sips would do a chorus as well. <laughs> She's uh, She will remain elusive and behind the scenes by choice. Um, she would absolutely add more value to the screen and instantly increase the value of this episode, but she won't she won't take away. She's got her own thunder going over there. All right, so groundbreaking night tonight, lads and ladies, the Owl Triangle. So let me tell you a story about this song. So this song was made famous by Ronnie Drew, uh, the lead singer of the Dubliners back in the 1960s. But the Old Triangle was originally uh, written by a man called Brendan Behan. And Brendan Behan is a well-known playwright, a well -known, uh, was a well-known um, wit and Irish um, literary figure in the early part of the 20th century in Ireland. And he wrote this song as a poem originally in one of his books. And it eventually uh, was turned into a song. And the Dubliners made it famous and many more bands have made it famous since. But basically the story of the song goes like this. It's about a man who has found himself in jail uh, uh, for reasons that they don't go into. So we don't delve too much into that. But a man has found himself in jail and prison in Ireland. And he uh, is in this jail. Uh, maybe it's Kilmainham Jail in Dublin. And he's missing the outside world, as you'd imagine. He's missing the, the pints of the creamy pints of Guinness. He's missing his girlfriend. He's missing the outside world. But every morning at four o'clock in the morning, the jailer wakes everybody up by taking an iron bar and banging it on a big metal triangle that hangs in the courtyard. And this big triangle resonates throughout the prison, throughout the jail, every morning at four o'clock. And it's a signal of the work to be done. And it's a signal that you're inside and the world is outside. And it's a reminder of the things you're missing. And it's a reminder of your life in there. And so Brendan Behan pens this song, this poem as a acknowledgement of his life in the prison and his desire to be outside. So we're going to sing that from the Queer Fellow. That's right. Greg mentions uh, the Queer Fellow is the name of the, the play that Brendan Behan wrote that this was uh, this was included in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing the chorus first. Let me get the chorus up here first. And then I'm going to sing the first verse. All right. Let me put up the chorus. Okay, so this is the chorus. And that old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. All right, so I'll sing the chorus and then I'll sing the first verse. And then we'll talk about how we're all going to get involved. <laughs> As if I can tell whether you're singing or not. Oh, Blair had a good point there. He reckons uh, he's surprised I didn't bring in a song during the debate. Or she listened, didn't they win it anyway? <laughs> Mount Joy Jail, says Dahi. Good stuff, not Kilmainham. That's it, Mount Joy Jail. All right. So here we go. This is the chorus. You ready? And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. All right, let's sing it again. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the royal canal all right so that's the bit you're all going to sing in with me uh, sing from wherever you're joining from around the world and let me know if you're singing or not but there's a rod stewart version of this as joe moore has let me know we'll get him on next week and he'll sing a rendition of grace <laughs> if anybody has rod stewart's number let me know and we'll get rod on to sing an old sing an old bar of that all right so I'm going to bring up the first verse now, and then we'll join in with the um, with the chorus. Right? You ready? A hungry feeling came o'er me, stealing 
And the mice were squealing in my prison cell. Everybody. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. Or oh, to start the morning, the warden bawling, get up out of bed you and clean out your cell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. First three. Oh, the screw was peeping, and the lag lay sleeping, as he lay weeping for his girl Sal. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. Verse 4, on a fine spring evening, the lag lay dreaming, and the seagulls were wheeling high above the wall, and the old triangle went jingle, bloody jangle, all along the banks of the Royal Canal. My favorite verse now, I have it up here. Up in the female prison, there are 75 women, and among those women, I wish I did dwell. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. All right, everyone join in together. We'll sing this verse one last time. And the old triangle went jingle jangle all along the banks of the Royal Canal. All along the banks of the Royal Can I... Yes. Round of applause for me. <laughs> From me to me. <laughs> I mean, we can't top that. That's it. That's the end of it. Listen, you've been brilliant. Um, I'm not going to sing out every night, or maybe I will. It's one way to clear the room. One way to clear the room. But listen, slaunch it to everybody. Um, we'll get together in a room at some point and sing that together and we'll have a bit of crack. But listen, I'm going to keep sipping on a drop of the old Irish stuff here. Um, you've been amazing uh, in the couple of hours that we've been on here. Thank you so much to those of you who've gone out and placed your orders. I saw them. Thank you. Thank you so much for the sip box. Uh, get your glasses if you want them. But we'll be back again next week. What are we doing next week? Next week, I'm bringing on a friend of mine, Lisa. Lisa McGrath from Waterford in Ireland, and she lives in Boston. And Lisa McGrath works for uh, Jameson, and we are going to dive into John Jameson and his history and his 500 children that he had. And we're going to sip on Jameson all night, different Jameson products. And we're going to, um, yeah, we're going to we're going to have the crack. We're going to have some fun. It's not going to be an academic tasting, and it's not going to be a history lesson. It's going to be a good old time. Lisa's great crack. And uh, we're going to get a few drinks into her before she comes on, and she'll be even more cracked. So um, listen, well done for the sing-along. I see, uh, oh, look, sing-along in Kobe in Japan. We had Rob Hennessy singing along. Rob, we were only talking today, me and the missus, about uh, putting Japan on the bucket list for uh, a, good old, a good old trip when the world opens up again. Um, so Jonathan says, whiskey in the jar next week. All right. We'll do whiskey in the jar next week. So the request is in. We'll do it. We'll get Lisa to sing along as well. Uh, a few drinks in her. She's a great house singer. Otherwise, she's a terrible singer. 
All right, slaunch your lads and ladies, Maureen and Jonathan and Johnny and Chris uh, and Blair and Joe and Greg and Martin, uh, the whole lot of you. Uh, thanks so much for your support. As always, I'll see you on the Facebook group. I'll see you here next week. Slaunch you. Happy 4th of July, America. Here's to uh, a good weekend, a safe weekend. Stay healthy, stay safe. Wear your masks and uh, social distance. I'm going to make some shepherd's pie with the missus. Slaunch you.